Come now to God's Word this morning. We're back in Luke. We're in Luke chapter 6 this morning. We're continuing on in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. And you can find that in page 1024 in your pew Bible. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot. And Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who had become a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out from Him and healed them all. This is the Word of our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, You have promised that Your Word will not return to You void, but will accomplish the purpose for which You have sent it. So we ask, Father, that You would accomplish Your purposes this morning through the preaching of Your Word. Convict us of our sin. Show us Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, driving around here in Lansing and northwest Indiana, I've had to get used to being stuck behind trains. It's just a part of driving around here. But this past week, I had something happen that has never happened to me before. I was driving down Gledwood, Lansing, headed towards Calumet, and I was stuck at that intersection behind a very slow-moving train, which is normal so far. The train took about five minutes to clear the intersection. The guardrails went up and we started crossing the intersection. But then after about ten seconds, the guardrails slammed back down, which seemed odd. And then to my despair and to the despair of all the dozens of other cars around me, that same slow-moving train that had just been blocking the intersection started coming backwards, back across the intersection again, blocking us. I remember thinking first, well, I can't tell you what I thought first, but (laughs) but I remember thinking, something has to be wrong. Trains aren't supposed to go in that direction. Trains are supposed to go forward. That's not the way that this is supposed to happen. I tell you this story because as we've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke, especially the past couple chapters, chapters 4 through 6, as we've been diving into the ministry of Christ, it's become clear that it's not going in the direction that we might expect. As Christ's kingdom has been coming in force, it feels as if this is not the way that it's supposed to happen. Because time after time after time, as Christ has displayed the majesty and the glory of His kingdom, He's been met with opposition and hostility. It's not the way that you would expect it to go. When He declared the good news to the poor in His hometown of Nazareth, what happened? He was driven out of the city and they tried to murder Him. When He healed the lame man, He was labeled a blasphemer. When he healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, those gathered around him were filled with fury towards him. It seems like this is not the way that this is supposed to happen. That the ministry of Christ is going in the wrong direction. That perhaps something is wrong. But brothers and sisters, I propose to you that it is not a mistake that Luke presents to us the ministry of Christ in this way. He does so on purpose. 
He does not shy away from showing us the opposition that our Savior endured because He knows that the churches that He is writing to will endure the same opposition as they seek to follow Him. As the people of God, as His disciples, as we seek to follow Christ, oftentimes it will feel like we're going in the wrong direction. As the Gospel transforms our lives, as the Gospel transforms our neighborhoods, we will experience the reality of opposition. Perhaps you felt that. It's difficult. But it's a part of the very real call of discipleship. The call to follow our Savior in making manifest the Kingdom of God in our lives and in our world in the face of opposition and hostility. And so what Luke presents to us in this Gospel is what we need to remember as we face the reality of opposition and the radical call of discipleship. What do we need to fasten our hope to? Where can we find certainty? We find certainty not in our religious methodologies, not in our spiritual performance, but in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what we need to remember as we face both the reality of opposition and the very real call of discipleship is that Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end of our discipleship. Or to put it another way, as the words of the hymn that we'll sing to close this service say it, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. That's what we find as we come to our passage this morning. Luke takes a break from showing us the opposition that Christ endured to demonstrate to us in the face of our opposition that He is the all-sufficient foundation of His church. He is the beginning and the end of our discipleship. And He presents this to us in three ways. First, by showing us Christ's prayer for us. Second, by showing us Christ's providence over us. And finally, by showing us Christ's power in us. So first, Christ's prayer for us. If you look back at verse 12 with me, it says, In these days, He went out to the mountain to pray. And all night He continued in prayer to God. How does Jesus respond to the mounting opposition to His ministry? He retires to a mountain to pray. As Christ faced opposition, as He anticipated setting apart His apostles, as He anticipated instructing them on what it means to be His disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll have next week, as He anticipated all of these things, He knew that He needed to be near His Father. In His human nature, Christ submitted Himself to His Father in dependent prayer. And it says He continued all night in prayer. From sun, from sun down to sunrise, Christ dedicated Himself to His Father in prayer. This was extraordinary devotion. But we should not just focus our attention on the fact that Christ prayed. We should also focus our attention, we should ask the question, why? Now certainly it was because of His love and devotion for His Father. But I propose to you that there's even a deeper reason. That Christ spent all night in prayer. And we get the answer in the context of this passage. We find it in what immediately follows this all night prayer vigil. Christ's selection and commissioning of His apostles. I think it's safe to say that in the time of prayer, in the all-night time of prayer, Christ was lifting these men up before His Father in intercessory prayer. That these men were the substance of His prayers. That Christ was devoting Himself in prayer to His church. That's who these twelve men represent. These twelve apostles correspond to the twelve tribes of Israel. In these 
12 men, Christ was setting apart a new people, a new church in His name. He was investing them with His authority. And as He was about to do so, He devoted Himself to His Father in intercessory prayer on their behalf. Christian, take heart. Christ intercedes for you as His church. As you face the reality of opposition that comes from being set apart as a disciple, Christ is praying for you. That's what He tells Peter. Later on in this Gospel, in chapter 22, verses 31-32, through He tells Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And as it says in Hebrews 7, Christ always lives to make intercession for us. So as we face the reality of opposition, we do not do so alone. When everything seems to be going in the wrong direction, Christ is with us. Always living to make intercession for us, praying for us, so that our faith may not fail. You see, friends, one of the blessed truths of the Christian life is that we do not deal with the opposition of this world. We do not deal with the very real call of discipleship. We do not deal with these things on our own. No, we have a mediator. Someone who stands in the gap for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the mediator. He is the one who stands in between God and us, interceding on our behalf. And so I would ask you, Christian, do you live in light of this reality? Because in Christ's intercession for us, we see an invitation to follow that same path. That as we face opposition and hostility, as we face our own weakness and sin, we should devote ourselves in prayer, in dependence to Christ, our, to Christ our mediator. But more often than not, if we're honest, we don't. We don't submit ourselves to God in prayer. More often than not, when we see a problem, when we face hostility... We, in our own strength, make a plan on how to address it. We make a plan on how to fix it. And maybe, just maybe, we ask God to bless that plan. We plan and then we pray. But friends, that's not dependence. That's independence. Brothers and sisters, if Christ in His human nature submitted Himself to His Father's will and to His Father's care. Why won't we? Why are we so obsessed on trying to live this Christian life in our own strength and in our own power? This passage invites us back into dependence on Christ. Christ shows us the way. He is the beginning and the end of our discipleship. Because whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, we are dependent on Christ. Christ's sovereign will, His unconditional election is the only reason we're His disciples in the first place. That's what we see as we move forward in this passage. We see not only Christ's prayer for us, we see His providence over us. The list of disciples that we see in verses 13 through 16 are a, a beautiful testimony to the providence of Christ. These 12 apostles would become the foundation of the church. They'd be, they would, Christ would establish in them, in his name, his people, and he would give them his authority. That's what the word apostle means. It means one who is sent. An apostle is someone sent with the authority of another. 
These 12 apostles carried with them the authority of Christ. They were commissioned by Christ's authority and governed by Christ's providence. In naming these 12 disciples as apostles, Christ was demonstrating that His church would never cease to be governed by His authority. The providence of Christ means that He governs all of His creatures and all of their actions by the word of His power. And so it is with His church. He never ceases to govern His church. What did He say to Peter in Matthew 16? I will build My church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does Paul write of Christ and His church in Ephesians 1, 22-23? And He put all things under His feet and gave Him, speaking of Christ, and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Christ is the head of the church, and we are His body. And so the authority that He gives to His apostles here in Luke chapter 6 is a derived authority. Yes, they had the authority as the foundation of His church, but their authority was not of themselves. It was given by Christ. It was given by Christ the head and governed by His providence and care. Now why is this important? Because unless as the church we acknowledge that we are not our own, and the authority that we have in this world is given by Christ and governed by Christ, if we forget these things, we will fail to live well in the face of opposition and we will struggle with the radical call of discipleship. But when we realize that we have been elected and commissioned with the authority of Christ so that we can serve Him in this world, what confidence we will have in the face of all trials. Christ is with us. He stands behind us with His authority and His providence always governing us and always caring for us. Back when I was in college, I worked at a clothing store called the Men's Warehouse. I was the senior customer service associate. It's a nice title, but I had very little real authority. I was little more than a clerk. One of the things I'd have to do as the senior customer service associate is every once in a while I'd have to give a customer some bad news. Perhaps about the price or the availability of some item. And I was always a little nervous when I had to give that bad news because I always knew that I was going to face some level of pushback. There was going to be some controversy when I had to share that bad news. But I distinctly remember that one time as I was having to share bad news with a customer, my manager was standing right next to me. And so I looked over to her and she gave me a, a little nod and a look that told me, I'm with you. I've got your back on this one. And friends, that made all the difference for me as just the senior customer service associate. I had so much more confidence knowing that the authority that I was about to act in was not my authority. Brothers and sisters, as you seek to follow Christ, as you seek to live the life of a disciple in your school, in your workplace, in your home, in this world, you will face opposition. But take heart. Christ is with you. You are never acting in your own authority. You serve Christ under His authority, having been sent by Him with His providence caring for you and leading, and leading you. As Christ would go on to tell these very men later on in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. As if we need proof of this reality, we need to look no further than just the lives of these apostles. These were all common men. Most of them were just a bunch of Galilean country boys. 
In Acts 4, the priests and the religious leaders call them uneducated and common men. But in Revelation 21, we read that the names of these 12 men will be emblazoned on the 12 foundations of the New Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. Why? Because of something special about them? Because of their spiritual aptitude? No. Because Christ had purpose to work in them. Christ had purpose to work in them to display His strength in their weakness. These men were not special because of their religious pedigree or because of their spiritual aptitude. They were simply the beneficiaries of God's sovereign, provident choice. In, these, in the lives of these men, we see the extent of God's providence. That no matter how inept we may be, He will accomplish His will in us. He will accomplish His purpose in us because He has decided to do so according to the counsel of His will. This is the confidence that we can have as we seek to follow Christ. As we seek to serve Him. That He who is at work in us is greater than He who is in the world. By His authority and providence, Christ will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Our role now, brothers and sisters, is simply to confidently and dependently live in simple assurance of this reality. To serve Christ in assurance of His authority. As we come to the end of this passage, we see Christ descend the mountain with His apostles. And a great crowd of the rest of the disciples and a great multitude of other people gathered around Him. Why were they there? It says in verses 18 and 19, that all these came to hear Him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch Him, for power came out from Him and healed them all. As these people gathered around Christ, they gathered around His power. His power which came out from Him and healed them all. As we seek to face the reality of opposition and seek to respond to the call of discipleship as the church, we do so in assurance of Christ's prayer for us, Christ's providence over us, and finally, we do so in the assurance of Christ's power in us. Notice first who the power of Christ gathers. First it says His apostles, then His disciples, and then a great multitude of people. People who had yet to respond to Christ and become His followers. Christ is again seeking and saving the lost with His power. As the church, we can be assured that as we seek to follow Christ as His disciples, as we seek to preach His Gospel to the world, as we seek to live out of the New Commission, that one's mine. Listen to your mom, Benjamin. as we seek to live in the light of opposition internally or externally, it is not our strategies that reach the lost. It is not our power that reach the lost. It is not our, any of our spiritual aptitude that is going to make the difference as we seek to reach this world. What do we just see here? Christ is seeking and saving the lost with His power. So as we seek to reach this world, we are never dependent on our power. We're dependent on the power of Christ. His power by which He accomplishes His purpose. It's His purpose to seek and to save the lost. He accomplishes that in us, brothers and sisters, by His power. And notice how the power of Christ gathers these people. It says, that he came, it says that all these came to hear Him and to be healed. 
Christ's power, it works itself out in our lives through His Word. Through the healing power of His Gospel to transform hearts. So I propose to you that what we see in verses 17-19 through is nothing less than a picture of the church. A people gathered around Christ, dependent on His power, hearing His Word, receiving the healing and the forgiveness of His Gospel. That is the church, brothers and sisters. We need to remember this. Because when things get tough as the church, the temptation is to get pragmatic. To seek to struggle along in our own strength. And I would even go as far as to say that this is a particular danger for our church, given the season of life we find ourselves in. When we're experiencing a variety of different difficulties. The difficulties that come with cancer and disease and a variety of other trials. The difficulties that come with a pastoral vacancy. The difficulties that come with volunteer shortages and the hardened soil of our ministry context. In light of these things, we will be tempted away from dependence on the power of Christ and towards pragmatic and expedient solutions. But friends, if we seek to follow Christ outside of dependent prayer, outside of dependence on His prayer for us and our prayer to Him, if we seek to follow Christ outside of a confidence in His providence, His authority working in us, if we seek to follow Christ outside of a, a dependence on His all-sufficient power, we will fail. And that's good news. Because it is God's mercy when He frustrates our vain attempts to serve Him in our own strength and in our own power. You see, we lose our way as the church when we cease to be a spiritual people. A people dependent on Christ's prayer for us. A people confident in Christ's power and providence over us. And a people indwelled by Christ's power in us. Because friends, Christ, not us, Christ is the beginning and the end of our discipleship. He is the vine. We are the branches. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. So no matter what we're facing, would our confidence only ever be that Christ is at work in us by His Spirit. That's my prayer for our church. That's my prayer. That as we face trials of every kind, that we would become a people dependent on the power of Christ at work in us by His Spirit. That when, just when things seem to be going in the wrong direction, that we would not be surprised. That we would remember that this is how God has purposed to work in us. He works in and through the opposition of His church because He works through and worked through the opposition and rejection of His Son. This is God's purpose. This is His plan. This is how He works our salvation and redemption through the opposition and rejection of His Son. You see, this scene here in the middle of Luke chapter 6, it prefigures another scene on another mountain where Christ would go up to pray. And He would pray to His Father, asking that His Father would take the cup of His wrath from Him. And then He would descend that mountain in absolute assurance of His authority over what was about to happen. And He allowed Himself to be beaten and tortured and killed for us. And on that cross, just when things seemed to be going in the absolute wrong direction, Christ displayed His absolute power to save all who come to Him in humble reliance on Him. Those who come to Him for healing and forgiveness. 
as he lives now, he gives us that power by his spirit, brothers and sisters. And he continues to rule and reign over us. My prayer is that we would remember this as a church family. That we would be strengthened in this power. That was Paul's prayer. That was his prayer for the Ephesian church, a a church who faced all sorts of trials outside and inside. That was Paul's prayer. I'll leave you with that prayer from Ephesians 3, 14-21. Would this be our prayer as the church? For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, You are able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to Your power that is at work in us, make us a people dependent on that power, Father. Knit our hearts to Christ that we would find comfort in His intercession for us. That we would find strength in His providence over us. That we would be strengthened with power through His Spirit. Help us and keep us, Lord, from seeking to serve You in our own strength. Make us a spiritual people. Revive us, we pray. That as we, that we would gather around Christ our Savior and our Mediator, that we would gather around Him to find in Him our healing and our forgiveness. And Father, as we gather now around Your table, where we see the emblem of our Savior's sacrifice, where we see His body broken so that we, be, so that we, we may be healed, where we see His blood poured out so that we may be forgiven, would You refresh our hearts with His presence and His power. Confirm to us in this sacrament the free forgiveness of sins that we have by faith in Your Son. Would we see in this meal, in these elements, a visible depiction of the good news of this Gospel? And as we eat this bread and drink this cup, give us by Your Spirit the certainty that Christ our Mediator meets us in this meal that His body was broken for us, and that His blood was shed for our salvation. Do this all for Your own glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.